leaked description of the Trump White House enraged the US president and led to tip Kim Darroch's resignation. But the UK's former ambassador to the United States says he has no regrets. And Kim Darroch joins us now. Very good morning to you. It's, uh, it's a year on from what happened to you and so much has happened since then. Uh, particularly the coronavirus pandemic, of course, and huge uh, race relations crisis in the States. Do you feel freer right now, where you are, um, to be able to speak out about President Trump uh, in the way that you were honest but didn't expect to be leaked? Yes, thanks for reminding me of those, uh, those <laughs> poor days back in July. It's sort of... Dismissed them in my in my memory. Um, yeah, I always felt that I wanted to write about that extraordinary period when the British people voted for Brexit and the American people voted for a former businessman, a reality TV star, as their president. It was an extraordinary period of history. I thought that it made a good story, and I thought I had something to say about why that happened and what was behind those two uh, political earthquakes on each side of the Atlantic. Mm. There, there is an argument that, that it was a moment in time when populism came to the fore. And as you say, the president, uh, President Trump represented that and Brexit represented that. Um, when you look at comparing Boris and President Trump, Boris Johnson and President Trump, do you see similarities, not just in their popular appeal, but in their ability to lead through difficult moments? On their policy agendas, Susanna, they're very different, I think. Um, I mean, I think, I think the Prime Minister is actually quite liberal on issues like immigration, and Donald Trump mm -hmm. isn't. The Prime Minister is a great enthusiast for green policies, for tackling climate change, and again, President Trump isn't. I think they both have a talent for, how shall I put it, eye-catching, sometimes provocative public statements that send the media into a kind of meltdown and which, uh, which capture a lot of attention. And I think there is something about uh, the negotiating style of this government, this British government, especially in their handling of the post-Brexit post um, talks with the European Union, that looks a bit like Donald Trump's negotiating style. Now, only Boris Johnson knows if would have done that anyway, or if he's reflecting the, the Trump style in some way. Are so you, some... Are you um, uh, particularly thinking of a government minister standing in the House of Commons and admitting that they uh, are breaking international law, for instance? Um, that was, uh, no question, a quite extraordinary moment. Uh, and in 40 years in, uh, in the Foreign Service and, and in government, I can't recall anything like it. Uh, and we've always, as a country, one of our calling cards, one of our principles has been to stand by international law. We criticize other countries when they breach it. So to actually assert that we are going to, we're going to breach international law is an extraordinary, and I think, uh, deeply regrettable thing. Yeah, just explain that to our audience, actually, that, you know, if, if they do break the law and there is no deal, there's been a, a clear message, hasn't there, from the, uh, the Democratic Party in the US uh, overnight? Yeah, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, who's the, uh, the, the majority leader in the House of Representatives, was over in, in the UK, I think about 15, 16 months ago, saying, if you do something as part of your post-Brexit arrangements, which risks a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, or which otherwise puts the Good Friday Agreement at risk, we will not ratify a free trade deal in the House of Representatives. You won't get one. And you've heard that, I think, echoed over the last 24 hours with some of the prominent supporters of Ireland in the Democrat Party saying, since the Irish are so unhappy with what we are contemplating doing on, uh, on the withdrawal agreement, that that's going to put things at risk. So it could also put the EU-UK free, 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 free trade deal at risk. So there's quite a lot riding on, um, on this, um, this, uh, this strategy. It seems very, very high risk to me, apart from being, I think, 
you know, very much against our principles. Okay. Let's go back to the communications that uh, got you into hot water. You never expected them to uh, see the light of day. You described mm. Trump as inept, dysfunctional, radiating insecurity. You talked about the night that he was elected, fear and loathing, stalking the corridors of Washington. Um, do you think he can win a second term? Yeah, I mean, as you as you pointed out in the in, in your introduction, that was a letter intended for about six or seven people in Whitehall, senior ministers who were attending a uh, a meeting to talk about how we handled UK US relations under this new administration. Never intended for public consumption, and we're paid to tell it like it is. Obviously, a public document would have looked very very different. But I stand by the um, the, uh, the assessment that I made in my predictions for the future. Uh, though I also said in the letter that there was an indestructibility about Donald Trump that meant really however however his presidency unfolded, you should never rule out his winning a second term. Um, as of now, the polls suggest that Joe Biden is the clear favourite. He's ahead comfortably in the national polls and in those battleground states that ultimately decide how the election will go. But there's still a way to go until uh, voting on the 3rd of November. We've still got the three presidential debates to come. Stuff can happen. Yeah. Uh, you can guarantee that Donald Trump will go on the attack. He's already trying to label Biden as basically a Trojan horse for the far left in American politics, which I think is a bit far-fetched, but you know, who's, who's, we'll see how that unfolds. So yeah. you know, I think uh, it's still much too early to call this, to call this election. Uh, and do you think Boris Johnson has that same indestructibility? Well, I think we'll see. When we, I think he's had, uh, you know, a difficult start to his uh, prime ministership. I mean, he won that exceptional 80-seat majority, which means that he ought to be guaranteed, you know, his, his five-year term with a comfortable parliamentary majority. But then he gets hit by the pandemic, and that is a once-in-a-century event, and that's proved extremely tough. And as those of us, as you may know, I worked for 15 years of my career on European Union negotiations. I never believed in an oven-ready deal. I always thought it would be extremely difficult and require some painful concessions from us. And I think that's how it's working out. Well, Kim Darrett, Lord Darrett, thanks very much indeed for joining us. The book is Collateral Damage. Um, and you know about that, that's for sure. It's a fascinating insight <laughs> into uh, the populist presidency. Uh, and leadership in the UK. Thanks very much indeed for being with us. Thank you very much for inviting me.